Lord, I do ask you to help us to understand your words. Help us to be good students of your words. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, uh, you have Jude open. If you would, hold your finger there. Go back to Galatians. Uh, Virtually all of the commentators, many of them, majority of them, I haven't looked at all of them, obviously, but... They generally will teach that Jude was a half-brother of Jesus, and then they'll teach that James was a half-brother of Jesus. And I don't care if a billion people say a lie, it's still a lie. And I, um, and again, it's not, it's not something I'm going to fuss with somebody about, but I would say James and Jude are the apostles. Okay, James and Jude. And uh, in Galatians 2.9, so um, it says, When James, Cephas, that's the other name for Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, Paul, they gave to me and Barnabas, so this would be before Acts 15, because that's where Paul and Barnabas had their little tiff, and they separated. Okay, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. So that apostleship seemed to remain with James, Peter, and John. And it's interesting that they're written in that order. You almost always say Peter, James, and John. But it's James, so Epistle of James, Cephas, 1st and 2nd Peter, John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. And then Jude. So we're in Jude. And he, he continued what was started in James where the word general is added in the title. The general epistle. And so we'll see some verification of that in the writings that the uh, Jewish slant of these letters are preparing the Jewish people of the last days. And then what they're going to take is some stories out of the Old Testament, some experiences in front of the Bible, and then pull them to the back of the Bible. And Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. And another time he said, as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be. And, of course, look in Jude 6, there would be Genesis 6. And then Jude 7 is Genesis 19. So they're both covered. So I think uh, we went 1 and 2 last time. And so 3 would be new ground. Uh, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. Okay, now I would say the key word is diligence there. If you would, go back to 2 Peter. Diligence. And it's amazing how lackadaisical people are. Okay, dad, my dad would teach us that, you know, when you do a job, it doesn't take much more of an effort to do it right. And besides, if you don't do it right, often you have to do it again. A uh, perfect example is, is, a, is a house that we lived on Buncombe Road. They had a sump pump, and this second house, that I, this house that I built, I made sure it was all gravity or naturally flowing, you know, or density or whatever. Okay, and so uh, no sump pump at all. I didn't want a sump pump because at the house down there, it, it, it had a sump pump, and they used black tile, you know, tube and flexible. And as the water went up, that tile would sag and then hit the level on the sump pump so the sump pump wouldn't turn up. So then I'd have that much water in my basement. And all I had to do is go hit the tile and all of a sudden the pump would kick on. And so uh, guess what I did? I did it again with tile instead of PVC that doesn't sag. And I don't know how many times my basement flooded because I was lazy or took the shortcut, and not doing it right. Okay, wasn't diligent enough. Okay, and so in 2 
Peter chapter 1, he writes in verse 5, Beside this, giving all diligence, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and so forth and so on. Diligence, key word there. Diligence is the key, is the, the key word uh, for a precise athlete. You got to be more diligent. Uh, when I played basketball in college, you know, you, they didn't at this time that we didn't learn this in high school is that you get your feet ready in their position before you receive the pass facing the basket. So you take catch it, shoot it. Okay. Now in a quarterback, in the pros, they have to be so precise they don't throw to the player; they throw to a spot. And the player may not even be looking when he's throwing it, but he's heading to the spot. That's how precise, at the higher up in the sport they go, they have to be. Because it's split seconds, just like that. And in, in, our, in our world, uh, the, uh, the uh, conservative Christians, and they're nor normally conservative in their politics... Uh, an example of that is on, on YouTube, there's a guy named Mark Dice, okay, and he has some really funny videos, good videos, and uh, he's a conservative in politics, but very loose in his Bible. And a lot of people are conservative, conservatives kind of comes synonymous with Christianity, okay, but yet they're very liberal with the words of God. And, they, and sometimes folks tend to think, well, if I'm a conservative, that's equal to a Christian. No, there are a lot of conservative people who are going to die and go to hell because they're not conservative with the words of God. And so, um, yeah, uh, here he says, be diligent. Just as diligent as a person is with mixing paint or sending an email out or... In any realm, if you're going to repair an engine, you make sure you, you know, look at the manual and see how you tighten the, the uh, head bolts and so forth and so on. We got to be where a person is very diligent in the things that they love. And so that's why we got to be very diligent and precise with the words of God, because that's how people get off. Not being precise. And then he adds another idea in there. Common salvation. <clears throat> salvation that is common to all. Okay, where in Mark 12, 37, it says that it was the common people that heard them gladly. In our culture, uh, maybe you've heard this, the term the common law. Okay, a common law. I think it was, if it don't fit, it must acquit. Uh, that guy had a common law wife. Okay, and that's a uh, common law on that is that uh, if a person doesn't have ceremony or a marriage license, if they cohabit together for seven years, some states is three, I'm not sure what Indiana is, three or seven usually, then that's considered a marriage. That's in the common law. Okay, and common law means that the law is common for all of us. There's not a... Just us, J-U-S-T-U-S. -S. That's what a judge said down in Jasper County years ago in the paper. Justice means just us. And that's the idea. Yeah, it's a law for you, but not for me. And of course, we saw that through the COVID thing. How many of these, like Gretchen up there, whatever that Gretchen thing is, where it, he, or whatever it is, uh, would have rules, but yet he and his, uh, you know, didn't have to obey the rules. And, of course, uh, Newsom, a guy out in California, did the same thing. Okay, and so that common law means that common man, the common man is an equal status. Okay, and so common salvation, where in, in the book of Acts, as there's a transition coming through there, uh, and that's what Galatians was talking about. Galatians, uh, where they had that meeting and they said, Paul and Barnabas, you go to the Gentiles. We're going to go to the circumcision. We're going to keep doing that. And that's what they did keep doing. Okay. And that, and in Acts 15, P 
Peter became the spokesman, and, and then he concluded from verse 7 to 11. Uh, 7 11, that's convenient. Okay, and so uh, he concluded there that uh, salvation is same. We receive the Spirit as they received the Spirit, and it's by grace. That'd be Acts 15. And so that's what they concluded. Then in Acts 8, you have the Ethiopian eunuch, or the Ethiopian who comes to the Jewish Messiah, believes in a Messiah. In Acts 9, a Jewish man believes in the Jewish Messiah. And then in Acts 10, an Italian believes in a Jewish Messiah. Why? Because salvation is now common. Okay, and so he says that, I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. Then he says, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly <coughs> contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Okay? Now, when we see the word contend, uh, what comes to mind is, you know, you know, duke it out with somebody to contend. But that not necessarily means that, to duke it out with somebody, uh, to be... Uh, contend for the faith. You can contend for this faith with uh, a good spirit. Okay? Uh, and this is, when we see those words, uh, several years ago, I was, you know, I don't know if I was mowing the lawn at Rensselaer or something. A couple Mormon boys stopped by. And uh, they said, hey, do you got them that, that, that literature about Jehovah Witnesses? And I thought, oh, oh, that's interesting. So I I said, I, I might have, you know, a variety of chick tracks. I said, yeah, I think I got Jehovah. Witness. I got one for Mormons, too. You know, and, I, and I, I got several. Oh, you got several. I said, yeah, I sure do. And they must have been having problems with Jehovah Witnesses, you know, going around. So they wanted somehow to figure it out. And then one of them said, have you ever read the Book of Mormon? I said, no. Uh, he said, would you be willing to? I said, sure. Uh, I don't want to read the whole thing because half of it's plagiarism from the King James, so I read it anyway. Uh, and he said, well, would you? I said, point out three spots and I'll read them. And I said, I'll even pray for a burning in my bosom. And, and that means that it's confirmed. And I, and I sincerely did give it an honest look. And, and one of the passages, I forget if it was knee high, knee fight, knee something, I don't know what pop they had. But they, uh, it was one of those, and it read, tongues are forever. And the Spirit of God says, 1 Corinthians 13 says, tongues shall cease. I said, okay. And then another place, it says, all contentions of the devil. And then the Spirit said, Jude 3, earnestly contend for the faith. And I forget what the third one was, but there were three of them. And that's where it came to, uh, I put that track together, are you a Latter-day Saint, a Latter-day Saint or a stain in the latter days? Because saint and stain had the same letters. It's just mixed them around. And uh, so when they came back, I pointed that. They said, did you do what you said? I said, yeah, yeah. I, I, that burning in my bosom, it, it occurred after I had some habanero. And so uh, uh, I said, let me show you something. Here in the Book of Mormon, it says, tongues are forever. And here in the King James, it says, tongues shall cease. Which one's right? And he said, both of them. I said, okay. And I said, here it says, contentions of the devil. And here it says, earnestly contend for the faith. Which one's right? He said, both of them. I said, okay, thank you very much. Now I have a burning in my bosom that you're lying to me. <laughs> so, uh, earnestly contend for the faith. Okay, uh, in, in sports, sports definitely reveals uh, the weakness of our flesh. Okay, and we're never going to bat a thousand or a hundred, you know, as far as in the sports world. But I seriously really work at maintaining my testimony on and off the court. I really work at that. I don't, I, you know, I don't bat a hundred or a thousand on that, but I do work at it. And, joke, and I can joke around with guys and I can compliment when they burned me. They burned me. I said, man, good shot. Good play. Just being honest about it. And that kind of relaxes a lot of guys. And, of course, that's my intent. I, when you run a league, you don't want a smart aleck in there. 
And uh, so, and that's my intent to try to keep the competition at a friendly competition. And because I've done that through the years, I would dare say one of the men that I do play basketball with, uh, last summer his father passed away. And if I was a jerk on the court, okay, and you remember me being a jerk off the court, uh, when the Catholic Church would not do the funeral for his dad, he called me. And so I, I was given that opportunity to give the gospel presentation to about 50 people that would never darken our church door. And I really don't think he would have done that if I was, you know, contending a, as a jerk on the court. Okay, and uh, so we can contend in, in a right way with a good spirit. You know, rightly dividing is vital, okay, and doctrine is vital, but a good spirit's vital also. And a lot of times people will say, well, I have righteous anger, <laughs> Sure, Bob. Uh, in James 1.20 says, The wrath of man worketh not the righteous of God. And I've learned through the years that, okay, if somebody makes a statement, it's a false statement, I could pop them in the nose and say that's wrong. But, you know, uh, I, my technique, I like to kind of come behind the back of their head and go like this. And then they turn around and say, what was that? And I found that that's actually more effective. Down at the truck stop when uh, these guys have the new Bibles, I'd give them a verse that's missing. And usually the third time, they would be angry. But not at me. Because somebody changed their road map. And they would get asking questions. Depending on their background, one, one uh, former missionary was you know, upset about it anyway. And I would ask him, I said, hey, if you bought a road map here in this truck stop and I-65 was running east and west, would you take it back? Oh, yeah. Well, what about your Bible that's missing actual highways? (laughs) Okay, take it back. So we can contend for the faith, you know, with a smile on our face. Because truth, whether you take a knife and go, yeah, like that, or you still got the knife in. <laughs> and so that's what the Word of God will do. So we, he wants us to be diligent and contend for the faith. The faith is, is a body of belief. That, that, that first found, is found, the faith is found in Acts 3, 16. I'm pretty sure that's what it is, and I want to verify that. Acts 3.16. Yep, there it is. I'm pretty sure that's the first time. And a study on 3.16s are really interesting. John 3.16, 1 John 3.16, 2 Timothy 3.16. It's something about that verse. Or if you want to do like what Al Gore did where he tried to be more spiritual, he said, you know that famous verse, John 16.3. Uh, <laughs> he must have had dyslexia or something. I don't know. But you know, those guys that really try to show how spiritual they are, it's a hoot. They, they can't even hold the Bible right side up. Okay, and uh, so yeah, there it is the first time. Acts 3.16, and, and his name through faith in his name hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know, yea, the faith, which is by him hath given him this sound, a perfect soundness and in the presence of you all. That's the faith of Jesus Christ. And then, of course, Paul said, you know, be followers of Christ as, or be followers of me as I am of Christ. So there are some adjustments. Okay, and I would say the perfect illustration of that is one fella asked Jesus, what must I do to have eternal life? Another fella asked Paul, what must I do to be saved? Now, they're not identical, but I would say eternal life and saved is pretty close. Well, Jesus said, you know the commandments, do them. Paul said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Now, in that case, if somebody asked me, what must I do to be saved? First off, I'm probably going to faint and then get up and say, what did you say? (laughs) 
I'm going to follow Paul's example, which glorifies Jesus Christ. You see, where the Lord said what he said, both of them were right in their answer, but one was under Judaism, and one is after Calvary under Christianity. And so that's the example of, of uh, Paul. So then in Jude verse 4, For there are certain men crept in unawares who are, were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, <clears throat> turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, fleshly desires, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, now this creeping in... Okay, if you would try Matthew 13, 30. In Matthew, Jesus gave seven mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Uh, <clears throat> throughout Paul's writings, he gave six mysteries for the kingdom of God, and then Peter added a seventh one. In Matthew 13, 33 is what I want. <clears throat> This is one of the parables, and it's, a, it's just a very short. And he says this, Another parable spake he unto them, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, till the whole was leavened. Okay, so this is prophesied by Jesus. Okay, cross-references, let's get the definitions. The kingdom of heaven, of course, that's a physical kingdom. 11, cross-reference, Matthew 16, 6 and 12. 11 is considered false doctrine. Okay, remember Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, Matthew 16, 6. And then in verse 12, oh, they understood he meant to beware of their doctrine. So 11 is false doctrine, which a woman took. Okay, not a chaste virgin, the church, but a woman. So a woman would be a church structure. A strange woman is found in the Old Testament. It would be a false church. So a woman, a false ch church, took false doctrine and sprinkled it in the meal. And a meal offering or a meat offering in Leviticus 2 is a picture of the word of God. So the kingdom of heaven prophesies that a false church is going to put in false doctrine in the Bible and the whole's going to be leavened. So if you go chronologically throughout church history, the manuscripts were focused in Jerusalem, okay, the, you know, as far as the writings, because oracles of God committed to the Jews. So there they are. Jesus had the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, 39 books. So there's his scriptures. And then you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and so forth and so on. So they're in Jerusalem. Now the word of God wants to go out from there. So sets of manuscripts that went two locations, basically. One south to Alexandria. And then more north up to Antioch of Syria. Okay, so you got two branches coming out. Down here in Alexandria was a famous school. That's where Alexander the Great was going to try to unite the world under many different uh, races and everything. And they had a, a museum, the Museum of Alexandria, a muse, and they had a big library and education. And one of the teachers was a guy named Origen. Prop, I would, I guess that Oregon was named after him, but Origen. Origen would be... Uh, his beliefs are similar to Jehovah Witnesses of at least the Arian portion. The Arian doctrine is that Jesus is the first creation of God. He was a created God. That's why he's lower than God, Jehovah, and then Jesus. And Origen believed in that. And so Origen would get these manuscripts and mess around with them, taint them, remove stuff, add stuff, and that's certain men crept in unawares. He's like the first character. But if you go to like Moody and Wheaton College and any of the scholars, they're going to make Mr. Origen as a holy man. 
Okay, and then the more modern scholars that stepped it up is two guys named Westcott and Hort. Okay, and they were the ones that was kind of behind the revised version of 1881, 1880 in that range. And they, uh, one of them liked to smoke weed, one of them liked to drink his beer. They didn't like America. They didn't like the liberties that they had. They were Mariolaters. But yet these guys are godly men according to the scholars. Okay, Bob Jones University to really promote Westcott and Hort. I have no idea why they do that. Okay, but uh, so those two guys, now those two guys brought in a theory called textual criticism. And if you look that definition up, they say it's a science of studying manuscripts to ascertain which is closest to the originals without seeing the originals. Therefore, it's a false science. It's a guesswork. What's interesting is Westcott and Hort admired Charles Darwin, who uses a false science of looking things in the present day to try to figure out how things originally began back in the boot day. It's a, both of them are false sciences, and they're comparable. These are the ones who crept in and tainted the manuscripts and the lexicons and the leprechauns and everything involved there. Okay, and they're the ones that put those definitions in there. And I, I, I mentioned to Brother Frank, I find it interesting, <clears throat> if you play the Greek game, and it's a really easy game to play, you get strong concordance, and they've got the numbers, Okay, so they'll, they'll have the, the word and then where it's located chronologically. And at the end of the word is a number. And that will relate to a number in the back of Strong's in the Hebrew words and Greek words. And then you go back to the Greek words or Hebrew. In 2 Timothy 2.15, you go back to the word study. You find study. You see the number. You go back and look. And they'll have a series of options. Choices you could choose to translate. Oh, I prefer this one. Okay, and study is one of them. Okay, and be diligent. And that's what the one, be diligent, what the new Bibles choose. Well, then when you go to rightly divide, most of them take out rightly divide. But if you go to the word divide, it again has the Greek word. But if my memory serves me correct, the only choice they gave you is divide. They chose something that wasn't there. To change the wording. And they do that without telling people. Certain men crept in unawares. Now what I do, uh, and I think it, this is where Jesus said, we've got to be wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. You know, if I, when I cross these people's paths, I try to figure out, are they a thermostat or a thermometer? Okay, a thermostat controls the temperature. Thermometer records the temperature. So are they parrots recording what they've been told? Most, many of them are that. And when they come there, then I point out some things. Instead of the, the reaction of anger, okay, I think I had me a thermostat. But if it's a reaction of, I never saw that before. Where they begin to question. I so, yeah, that's, that's a problem. And I have an answer if, I can, if you'd like to hear it. It's, it'll be a great blessing if you believe it. And, and that way you maintain that door opening with them. Okay, and that's where in 2 Timothy it says that we try to declare the word of God with meekness. Okay, and easy to be entreated. And... and that, that's a thing that we Bible believers, you know, you know I, we can be bold in the words of God, but then again, depending on who we're talking to, especially if it's a one-on-one -on -one situation or in a more informal setting, then we just try to gently show these, them these things. So in Jude, he gives us that information. There are certain men crept in unawares. Okay, another place, if you go to Acts 20... Okay, in Acts 19 is uh, where Paul first went to Ephesus. So that's 
That's the beginning of his ministry in Ephesus. And the first thing he uh, brought up is the Holy Ghost. Okay, so that's the first thing. And I think that lays a foundation to understand uh, the seven verses in Revelation about leaving their first love and, and doing first works. But Paul gave them a little heads up. He said, I'm taking off. So this is like his farewell address. And he says in verse 29, Acts 20, 29. For this I know, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. So that's when you get your 66 caliber and your sheepdog and... And kindly put a silencer on the muzzle <laughs> and go boom. <laughs> so that, that's a common thing. And of course we know that's the devil behind that to create confusion. Okay, and then it says verse 30. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. So that's an option. That's an option also that takes place. So that, it's like Brother Frank and his ministry where you got new people coming in and it's something you, you, it's not like a church setting where you have, you know, a hierarchy. And so it's just something you observe. Okay. And uh, it's like, okay, we had somebody visit a while back and, and uh, the lady came to the ladies Bible study and it was, it was like she wasn't there to participate. She was there to you know, just get her viewpoint across. So where, yeah, it's kind of, kind of funny, when we go to Pennsylvania, Jan's brother, Uncle Roy, he, he, he likes to preach. And so when we go, last time we went, Uncle Roy starts preaching and Jan says, we haven't even been here 10 seconds and you didn't ask me, Uncle Roy, how I'm doing, how my family's doing, you started preaching at me. <laughs> and Uncle Roy, this is how it works. You talk, I talk. Now, she can get away with that, with Uncle Roy. <laughs> now, he goes, okay, Jan, it's your time to talk. <laughs> and then when it's his turn, whoo, he gets going. <laughs> and, but, yeah, he's excited about something. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that the thing is, is you just kind of work within the setting. <clears throat> okay, so there, verse 4, Jude is, is warning about that. And, and it says, denying the only Lord God. Now, they... Don't come right out and do that blatantly like the, like the Muslims. They do that blatantly. But the Catholic Church does that subtly. Okay, and then the New Bibles don't remove all of the verses on the deity of Christ. They just remove a few of them. Okay, because they, a perfect counterfeit can't take everything out. Now, years ago, maybe some of us are old enough. Do you remember? Anybody remember the Reader's Digest version came out in, I think, the mid-70s? They took so much out, it didn't sell anywhere. Okay, or like Thomas Jefferson, he wrote his own Bible. He just disregarded all the miracles and wrote his own. He was, you know, and, and of course, that didn't go anywhere. A good counterfeit, the best counterfeit is the New King James. Because those men involved claimed... They use the manuscripts of the King James, but when you see their little annotations, I see what you boogers did. They chose two over 5,000. And the thing about Mr. Schofield, he, unbeknownst to himself, let the cat out of the bag by naming them. In Mark 16, 9 to 20 in his footnote. That's what I like about that. Okay, and then in 1 John 5, 7, he put in a margin, the best manuscripts don't have this passage. But then you go to Mark 16, there's what he's claiming are the best passage. Two. Two out of 5,000. And those are the two that's behind all of the new Bibles. And what makes the new King Jimmy so subtle is that it's an intermingling of both. You see, the New American Standard can't fool the fundamentalists. Well, they did John R. Rice, but they can't really get the fundamentalists now. But the New King Jimmy 
did. You know, and uh, at one time, the the church up there in Chesterton, uh, Brother Delmer told me that he went to one of their meetings in the seven in, in uh, I think I don't know if it was the early eighties, and they were selling the New King James at that time, and then they then they quit selling that. And so that kind of, okay, kind of see what that's going on with there. I remember Brother Delmer was telling me about that. He said, I got me one of those. And I'm reading it. I said, hey, that just don't sound right. An honest man. You can't fool an honest man. And so, okay, so that's Jude uh, verse 4. We'll, we'll go with verse 5. Man, two verses each time. So that means in... <laughs> Okay, let's go ahead and pray. Lord, I thank you for your words. I pray and ask that you'd help us to be faithful to your words. I thank you for them. And I thank you for uh, the, the ministry you've given Brother Frank and, and Frank Jr. I just pray you'd uh, help them to be a real blessing to those veterans and anyone that participates in Jesus' name. Amen.